Okay. Last week we studied chapter 10, verses 1 to 23. And in these verses, this is the, uh, when you have two parts, you get the rerun of the last one so you know where we are. That's what you're getting now. Uh, in these verses, we were introduced to Cornelius the centurion. And we looked at how the Bible favorably treats all seven encounters with centurions. And they are, by design, trustworthy, honorable, and brave men of integrity. In verse 2, Luke says that Cornelius is a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So Cornelius, while not a Jew, is devoted to and serves God. God responds to his prayers because he is a man who seeks God and honors him with his time and with his possessions. And yes, you could come in. <laughs> God sees Cornelius' heart that it is prepared to receive the gospel. And he prepares a way in a miraculous way for that to happen. An angel appears to Cornelius to give him an opportunity to be obedient. And the angel visit him and visits him and basically says, do what I tell you and do, then do what the man I send you tells you to do. So nothing but orders, not any promises. Though those are implied that God is pleased with him, they're not mentioned that there's anything exciting happening. And yay! Come on in, Noah. Good to see you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Cornelius responds to God's authority, and he is immediately obedient. Now, we also saw Peter, who wasn't quite as quickly obedient, but ultimately was. Cornelius is in Caesarea Maritima and send service to Joppa, which is about 20 miles to the south. And normally that'd be likely to be a two-day journey, but they pull it off in 21 hours. And meanwhile, while, this is, while they are approaching, Peter is dreaming about being presented with unclean food from heaven. And that dream occurs three different times. And being a righteous Jew, he refuses it. And a voice responds to his refusal in the dream saying, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. So while contemplating the meaning of this dream, we read in verses 19 and 20, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Arise therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter is likewise obedient when they show up immediately, one of those God's timing things. And the next morning, they leave with the servants to Caesarea Maritima. And I've got to learn how to flip the page correctly. Now we will read in Acts 10, verses 24 to 33, which is the first part of our study this evening. And this is about the initial encounter between Peter and Cornelius. So starting with verse 4, Acts 10. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself, I am also a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, For what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter, 
He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner, by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things God commanded you, or all the things commanded you by God. There are a few things to note in this initial meeting between Peter and Cornelius. First is the expectation of Cornelius. This is an important event for him, and he has pretty much gathered everyone he cares about deeply to experience this event with him. He is excited in anticipation of Peter coming, and he knows that Peter is a man of God. He doesn't really know what to expect, though. So when Peter arrives, we see him falling to his knees, and it says, worshiping Peter. And since we learned earlier that Cornelius is a God-fearing man, I wonder, and I'm sure he probably knows that God is a jealous God, and that he is not to worship anyone but God. So I kind of wonder if the worship here is basically, and why he falls at his feet, and again, this is just my speculation, because I, I kind of like the centurion. <laughs> but I, I suspect it's not a matter of worship, worshiping Peter as much as it is a matter of respect for the position he has as a man of God and sort of falling before like you would Caesar. And Caesar is treated as a god, though he's a man. But falling before this man of God would, be, would seem to be the appropriate action in respect to the authority he has from God. So and as I said, Peter would probably, for him, command more respect than even Caesar would. So falling to his knees would be, seem appropriate. Obviously, to Peter, it isn't appropriate, and he immediately and humbly sets Cornelius straight that they are both just men and they're on an equal footing, even though through the conversation, some are more equal than others comes out, but they, he assures them they are both men and he is not that special. So Peter then speaks to the crowd, and his first word struck me as being a bit insulting. Let's look at that. At the very least, his response is very Jewish and proud. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase what Peter says there. He says, you guys know I shouldn't be here with you heathen Roman dogs. A little extra flavor added there. But God said I shouldn't consider you unclean and unfit for my company, so I came without complaining. Now, that's the way I read it. If you're a big Peter fad, you can read it different ways and look at what's said. But that was the way it hit me, is Peter's, you know, I really shouldn't be here, but I'm here because God told me to come. And that's okay. God will usually send us into situations that are not comfortable for us. All righty. It all, this almost implies that he's doing them a favor by not complaining and about being forced to come there to be with these low lowlifes. So Peter is not acting like he sees them as equals yet. I'm also thinking that in this case, if you remember in verse 23, it mentioned that some of his brethren went with him. And I think in the next chapter we learn that it's six, but that's not part of my teaching, so we won't, we won't tell you that. But this statement to them in the presence of his Jewish brothers does sound like he may be trying to justify it to them, and maybe as well as to himself. All right, Peter then basically says, okay, I came, what do you want? You kind of have to love Peter's matter-of-fact, no-frills interaction here. He's just, okay, I'm here. What, what do you want? Cornelius goes the other route. He gives a detailed, moment-by-moment -moment account of all that has happened to him over the next last four days. He also takes what to me looks like a mild shot back at Peter when he says, you know, it's good that you were obedient. Like, 
what other choice was there? But basically he says something to the effect of, we don't know why you're here, so tell us what God commands. Which basically Peter says, okay, open book. Now remember, Cornelius is ever the soldier here. He's obedient to orders, and Peter seems kind of oblivious to what's going on up to this point. So he is looking for Peter in authority to take control. And let's read on, verses 34 through 48, and continue and see that Peter does take control here. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that, through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on these Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water for these should not be baptized to have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they asked him to stay a few days. Okay, Peter with this invitation to tell the crowd whatever he wishes. And for the first time in this section, Peter waxes eloquent. He launches into the gospel story. Right after, if you notice, once again, he justified his speaking to and being with these Gentiles. So it seems Peter's almost trying to convince himself that this new word from God to reach out to the Gentiles is real. Verse 35, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So he's repeating to himself that he is supposed to be here. And this really is a radical idea for Jews, the chosen people of God. They have always been God's people and everyone else were rejects. They accepted but didn't pursue having proselytes come into the religion, but it, he was their God. So it is sort of a shocking you know, change of the paradigm for Peter and the other guys that are with them. We look at that and immediately can be sort of judgmental about how, you know, they, they don't have the only access to God, we do too. But do we not even year this many hundreds of years later not have the same sort of underlying belief that God, we're God's favorites. In fact, I got a little thing on my desk in there. You know, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. It's a very self-centered thought. But I want to challenge you to think about whether you think that way sometimes or not. 
God has favored America for 250 years or so, and that may be coming to a conclusion. But as Americans, we do think of him as being ours. We send out missionaries to the rest of the world, but our home is God's home. And his home is in us, so it's to some degree that's true. Okay. It, it's sort of a, his word tells us he belongs to all men, and we believe it. But there's still sort of this feeling of, you know, he's ours first. And it should not come as a surprise that these Jews at the time that the paradigm is shifting, feel that way. I think much of anti-Semitism is because the Jews do claim God as theirs. We disagree because the Jews killed Jesus, right? And the answer to that, that's a sarcastic question, is no, no one was able to kill Jesus. He laid his life down for us but he is ours. And I think to some extent, and I'm sort of sorry we're racially all one tonight because this really addresses all of it, but we do claim him racially as well. And you think, oh, you shouldn't say things like that, and maybe I shouldn't, but my tongue is looser than normal, which is pretty loose to begin with. Look at European artists and how they depict over many centuries what Jesus looks like. He's fair skin, often with blue eyes or green eyes. And at the same time, African artists have him as dark, which is probably far more accurate than light skinned. I've actually even seen pictures of him with Far Eastern features. Tom, did you see any of that when you're visiting the Far East? They're out there, but not as numerous because Christians aren't quite as common on that side of the world. But everybody wants to and has the right to claim Jesus as their own. The problem that occurs is Sometimes he's mine, but he's not yours, or he's more mine than he is yours. And Peter, in having this selfish heart, has far more cause than we do, yet we do it to some extent too. He almost is explaining surprise at finding that God doesn't play favorites anymore in this passage. I mean, it's, it's a shock to him. And up to that time, God had his children, his favorites. Okay. What little description we do have of Jesus comes from Isaiah, who, by the way, never saw Jesus in the flesh. But he does take a whole half of a verse to say in the last part of Isaiah 53, 2, that he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So at the very best, Isaiah is saying he's kind of a plain fellow, if not one that you immediately run away from. I speculated about that some as I was reading these passages and, and wondered if Jesus might not have features of every race so that he might be able to pass as being any race. Now, I'm not sure what that would look like, but I do suspect it would create a rather odd visage to have somebody that you could not pin down what their race was. And that's not real appealing to any of us because we want people to be like us. So, and that, like I said, that's pure gem speculation. And that's a bit of a rabbit trail, so let's get on back to, to Peter here. Peter starts by saying Jesus was sent to the Jews to teach peace. And he goes into the life and the ministry of Jesus from the 
point of being filled with power in the Holy Spirit at the time of being baptized until his death on a tree. And for those that have a question about whether he was fully God before the baptism of John, I'm not going to open that can of worms. But I am going to say to you, and it is, this verse is sometimes used to say, well, Jesus didn't have any power until he was baptized. And I do disagree with that. But if you are of that ilk, read more about it, pray about it, and I'm not the one that's going to tell you you're wrong. I will say that I, I see Jesus' baptism was about God revealing who he was to the world. And if you look at baptism today, that's the same thing. That is our revealing or God revealing through our making the choice to be baptized that we are his. So we are telling the world we belong to Jesus through baptism. All right, and bottom line is we don't want to use these or any other scriptures or verses to create division, but we always want to seek to share the truth of Jesus. And he is fully God, fully man. And that's very hard to wrap our tiny little brains around, but it is truth and it's, that is clear in the word. And some other things can muddy the waters for us, but if we are praying about what we want God to reveal to us, he will never set us on a wrong path. All right, Peter then gets to the resurrection and he gets in another shot at, at some to some extent of being special because he says you know some of us were chosen to be witnesses to the resurrection firsthand and you guys probably weren't is assumed in that but when he says that we need to understand and he was struggling with that God has no favorites and they were indeed very special and blessed but just like a good, loving father, which I know many of you are, you better not have a favorite child. And I work very hard at thinking that way through my life of raising children, and I hope you do too, because they will pick up on it. And that is, that's not God, and that's not what we should show as a loving father. So, you know, God doesn't have any favorites. And it's our nature to want to be special and set apart, apart. So I'm not trying to beat up, well, I am a little bit, beat up on Peter. But it's something we need to take to heart, that we are special to God, uniquely created, and each one of us is. But I'm not any more special than you are. Or even that you know, the drunk in the ditch is. Let's accept that God, we are all his children. And one of my illustrations for us really wanting, wanting to be special and set apart, it, while I was thinking about, excuse me, thinking about that, I uh, thought of Rich Mullins. And I don't know if you know who he is, but we actually sing some of his music occasionally, and he was killed probably 15 years ago now in an automobile accident. But he struggled with believing. And when somebody was trying to convert him, he, and he was, he was a pretty, could be a very dour guy. So somebody was trying to cheer him up and, and said basically, cheer up, God loves you. And Rich's response was, that's no big deal. God loves everybody. That doesn't make me special. It just means that God ain't got no taste. And he follows that up with, and that's true. He loves every one of us as if we were the only one in the world. And again, that's something that's hard to wrap our little brains around, but that is the love he shows for us. Okay, finally, in verse 43, Peter gets to our altar call and says, to him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And this is when God shows up. So let's look at that 
in verses 44 through 46 again. While Peter was still speaking these words, so he didn't call the Spirit down, he's still teaching. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. The Holy Spirit comes upon these Gentiles, and big surprise, the Jews are surprised. They don't think that's supposed to happen. And I, I love how this word reveals how God uses self-righteous, defective, sinning men to reach other self-righteous, defective, sinning men and women. One of my favorite teachers often says, and you probably heard it from somebody, and I don't think it originated with him, but we are just beggars showing other beggars where we found bread. And that's the attitude we need to have in sharing the gospel. It's not a, I got something you don't, and you need it. And that is what it is. But if we do that arrogantly and pridefully, it won't be received well. But if you're saying, look, my life was a wreck too, and I found Jesus, and he turned my life around for me, that's far more appealing that you need Jesus and, and often it does include this. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen that in action, has anybody not seen somebody, what I refer to as beating someone up with the Bible, beating, beating them down the Bible over their head? I had a beautiful example of that in New Orleans one time. And there was a nice young man, but he was sweating and screaming and trying to get all these folks walking up and down the street, having a good time. And drinking heavily, most of them, to repent. And he got, during all the time I observed him, he had one person that stopped to talk to him, and that was me. And I came up to him and said, you know, you're right, but is this the way to attract them to Jesus? And he pretty much brushed me off. And that was on a Saturday night, and we were downtown New Orleans, enjoying it as much as we could, and still be holy, but we, we were, that was at my last visit, and I mean that in every respect of New Orleans, as far as I know, unless God sends me there, but we, Carol and I, were having a good time there, and that was Saturday night, Sunday morning, we wanted to attend a church, and we found a Baptist church, it was right down in the heart of uh, Oh, shoot, forgot what they call it, but uh, of the, you, yes, of the French Quarter. I just couldn't remember where it was. And that's not because I drank too much. I won't say I didn't drink at all, but I didn't drink too much. <laughs> but in the middle of the French Quarter is this little Baptist mission church. And I, we go walking in, and the person greeting us, expressing all kinds of love and welcome and being just as kind as he could be, was the same kid that was on the street yelling at sinners the night before. So we need, without arrogance, to tell others about the bread we found, being the beggars that we are. Now, maybe it's just me, but this encounter between two very different men I see the primary virtue in both of them is obedience. There are other virtues that we see and other problems that we see, but the one they share and the most important one in this story is being obedient. Both of them show a bit of ego from time to time and both have some of their human frailty exposed during this encounter. But the hero of this story is very plain. And the hero is the one that always should be. It's the Holy Spirit. It shows up, he shows up, and changes everything. Or she, if you're real liberal. But the Holy Spirit shows up. And I struggle with that. I still, I just did it. 
go to calling the Holy Spirit an it, but it is just as much a person as Jesus and God. But the Holy Spirit shows up and everything is suddenly different. Now, I struggle with humility, and I suspect a few of you may as well. We want to share in God's glory, and as a loving Father, he allows that. But when we try to claim it as ours, it's a sin. And one of the solas of the Reformation that P.D. refers to every once in a while is soli deo gloria. And most of them are two words, this one's three, and it's to God alone is the glory. And we need to take that to heart and remember it as much as our egos will allow it. I literally laughed out loud at the conclusion of this chapter, and I hope you guys appreciate the humor of it all as well. Peter's response at the end is so anticlimactic after God shows up that to me it's com comical. And I'm going to paraphrase again. But Peter pops up and says, well, folks, I guess now they receive the Holy Spirit just like us. There's no reason we shouldn't have a baptism, huh? I mean, it's, is there any reason we can't have a baptism now? It's a very strange and anticlimactic response at that point. And apparently they do, but the new believers, I mean, their only input at this point is, you know, can you hang out a few days? I mean, our, the focus of that story was the appearance of the Holy Spirit coming down upon these new believers. And the rest was interesting. I love the way Dr. Luke presents his story. And by the way, I'm sure it's been mentioned, but Luke and Acts really should probably be together in the Bible as they were both written by Luke. And it is, if you read Luke and then go right into Acts, you'll see the continuity of that story. That can be considered one book. But he treat, Luke treats the men in this story, Cornelius and Peter, like men. They are both exemplary followers of Christ but he lets us see a few warts and he makes it very clear that the hero of this story is God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And that is the hero of our story. And if we ever forget that, we err. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for our time together tonight. And we thank you that you are a loving Father and you want to share all good things with your children. And Lord, like spoiled children, sometimes we want to snatch them and say, mine, mine, mine. But Lord, everything is yours, yours, yours. We are yours. All that exists belongs to you. And when we forget that, Lord, lovingly correct us and help us to reach out to those that don't know what love is. And that's a tragedy. And some of us are, are great at jumping into conversations with strangers and talking to them about Jesus. And for some of us, that's the most terrifying thing in the world to do. But regardless of our nature in that, you've called us to share the good news with others. So let us look for every opportunity you place in our path and know that with your Holy Spirit, we're sufficient to that task, not because of anything in us, except that you are in us. And we thank you for that, Lord. We again thank you for this wonderful evening. We pray that you'll fill each man here with your Holy Spirit to overflowing so that we are out there loving on others in a world that doesn't understand love. And we pray this in the name of Jesus who showed us what love is on the cross dying for us. In Jesus' name, amen.